light on contradual bourgeoisies, particularly in Europe as well as in periphery countries, which shore up imperialist globalization to the benefit of US companies. The anti-colonialist independence movements in the global south have had to keep putting up new defenses against these takeover attempts and protecting their country's democratic sovereignty. The perfidious thing about US hegemony is that unlike the imperialism in the past, it has stitched the propagation of freedom and democracy onto its flags. Under that banner, even the openly aggressive, bellicose side of colonialism is enjoying a resurgence in its own form. Since the turn of the millennium, under cover of waging its so-called war on terror, for example, the US, with the support of its NATO allies, has increasingly deployed military means to export its economic and strategic dominion over the oil-rich regions of the Middle East and Central Asia. The most striking examples of this neocolonial hegemony are without a doubt the occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq, which with the most horrific abuses of human rights, the wars which serve, which would serve as blueprints for subsequent interventions in Libya and Syria, each of them cost several hundred thousand human lives and laid the foundations for the rise of Islamic terrorism. In their professed objective, democratization and emancipation, they have failed completely. In view of the drastic consequences of the United States' illegal wars in the Middle East, U.S. intellectual Noam Chomsky called the U.S., I quote, the world's leading terrorist state, end of quote. Under the cloak of anti-terrorism, France, another former colonial power, also has a military presence in the Sahel. A particular focus is the military protection of uranium experts from the desperately poor Niger by the French energy company Areva. Niger being the main supplier for France nuclear power plants. The people of Niger, which is one of the poorest and least safe countries in the world, do not benefit from this. Quite the opposite. The German armed forces, the Bundeswehr likewise, has a presence in the Sahel. Despite the evident failure of its military interference in Mali, whose security situation has deteriorated significantly since the start of the MINUSMA military operation, and increasing differences with the Malian, Malian transitional government, the German government is insisting on keeping German troops stationed there in Mali. And a central argument in the German debate is that the region must not be left to the growing influence of Russia. That thinking in terms of spheres of influence reveals a colonialist attitude that is an example of the disregard for the sovereignty of African states. That democratic sovereignty of the countries of the South is also a thorn in the eye for the West when it comes to dealing with the war in Ukraine. This is exposed in the neo-colonialist attempts by the US and the European Union to involve countries against their own interests in the West's economic war against Russia. There is great incomprehension at the fact that at the United Nations General Assembly in March, 17 African states abstained from voting for the resolution denouncing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And yet it makes perfect sense that the countries of the South do 
do not want to be dragged onto the side of the West in the proxy war in Ukraine. Unlike the public in the West, many parts of the world predominantly take a neutral view of the history behind the war and of its geopolitical dimension. Representatives of the Global South, for all that they criticize Russia's violations of international law, of course, but they currently correctly point the finger of responsibility at NATO's eastward expansion as a key cause of the escalation of the conflict. Understandably, they point to the West's double standards, policy, and the countless illegal wars of aggression waged by the US and its allies, which did not elicit similar responses. In contrast, there is an ignorance in the West as to the African and Southern states' interest in a swift end to the war by diplomatic negotiation. Their wish for peace makes complete sense. After all, many of them are the countries that are suffering most from the effects of the war in the form of skyrocketing energy and food prices. Voices like those of African Union Chair Maki Sol, South African Foreign Minister Nalini Pando, and newly elected Brazilian President Lula da Silva, calling for a diplomatic solution and peace for Ukraine, are not heard in the West. Instead, the West is pursuing the goal declared by US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin to weaken Russia for the long term. The promising ceasefire negotiations held between Russia and Ukraine in Istanbul in March were rejected by the US and Britain. Unprecedented weapons deliveries and economic sanctions are imposed to bring Russia to its knees and open up the prospect of regime change or even the disintegration of the country parceled up along ethnic lines. This strategy is deluded and irresponsible for two reasons. Firstly, the nuclear power Russia will hardly be prepared to unconditionally give up in a conflict it is engaged in. And from its point of view, they say it's a protect, it to protect their own existence. And every passing day and every additional weapons delivery therefore increases the danger of the conflict expanding into the Third World War and the nuclear destruction of Europe, like it was last night. <coughs> Secondly, it is cynical to want to drive Ukraine into a protected proxy war and sacrifice its people, the Ukrainian people, on the battlefield for our own geopolitical interests. Wise observers, like the very prominent US American economist Jeffrey Sachs, were already vehemently warning against this in early April this year. Germany's federal government is submitting itself to this confrontational course and particip participating with massive sanctions in the unprecedented economic war underway against Russia. While German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock hopes they will allow her to, quote, ruin Russia, end of the quote, the sanctions having a boomerang effect. Even the German government had to admit a few days ago, in response to a parliamentary question I posed, that it had no knowledge, not, not, no knowledge at all about whether the sanctions were achieving their objective of hampering Russia's war economy. Instead, the state-controlled energy firm Gazprom in Russia has declared record profits equivalent, equi equivalent to 41.6 billion euros for the first six months of this year, thanks to the price increases that the sanctions have caused. 
For Germany, in contrast, the consequences of the economic war against what was its most important energy supplier are at the moment terrible. They have died. Inflation has reached record levels of more than 10%. One in four companies are having to cut jobs because of skyrocketing energy prices. Whole se we, we pay eight times more for energy than the United States. Eight times more, just imagine. Whole sectors are on the brink of ruin or planning to move production abroad. In short, Germany is facing deep industrialization with millions of jobs and Germany's entire prosperity model is at stake and social harmony in jeopardy. In these conditions, I think it would be suicidal for Germany to proceed even further and join the economic, uh, United States economic war against China as elements in the German government wanted. The debate being conducted to the end in the, in the West about a supposed systemic rivalry between liberal democracies and so-called authoritarian states is given the lie by the former neocolonialist dominator of the world alone. Decoupling ourselves from Germany's most important trading partner would moreover have terrible consequences for people in Germany, of which the economic war against Russia would presumably just prove a poor part, foretaste. The neocolonialist attempts by the US led West to exert influence on the countries of the South on the issue of the, of the war in Ukraine, just like the confrontation that the US is seeking with China, demonstrate that the US with the support of its European subordinate <coughs> allies, is trying at any cost to avoid losing its position as the sole, as a sole global he hegemonic power. At the same time, the hope is to halt the rise of China, which was recorded impressive development in recent decades and advanced from being one of the poorest countries in the world to the second largest economy in the world, and one of the most important drivers of technology and innovation. For the countries of the South, a multipolar world order represents a major opportunity to escape the neocolonialist jokes. After all, states around the world don't have many choices available in the era of unipolarity that has prevailed since the collapse of the Soviet Union. They either submit to the interests of the US or they have to accept the risk of falling victim to invasions, coups, and far-reaching sanctions. Just take Cuba as an example, which has followed its own socialist development path since the triumph of the Cuban Revolution in 1969 and as a result has been confronting an inhuman and illegal US trade embargo for more than 60 years. This is not changed in the slightest by the fact that just a few days ago, the vast majority, 185 states at the United Nations General Assembly again voted for the embargo to be lifted with the US and Israel voting against, and Bolsonaro's Brazil and Ukraine abstaining. The United States is evidently determined to make an example of the little Caribbean island and deter other countries of the South from achieving any development beyond the bounds of capitalist exploitation and free from neocolonialist subjugation. But Cuba's achievements in establishing outstanding education and healthcare systems and showing solidarity with other countries of the South, in spite of all the resistance and difficulties, 
are a great success and demonstrate that alternative development is possible. On matters of neocolonialist dominance over large parts of the global south, good relations between those countries and China, Russia, or India, and Brazil are a thorn in the West's eye. After all, they offer a means of defending democratic sovereignty by opening up a third option next to compliance or resistance namely neutrality. What this can mean has been put into words by Pierre Sané, president of the Imagine Africa Institute and former secretary general of Amnesty International, in connection with the vote at the United Nations on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and I quote, neutrality does not mean indifference. Neutrality means continuously calling for the respect of international laws. Neutrality means that our hearts still go to the victims of military invasions and arbitrary sanctions never imposed on NATO countries. End of the quote. Where the causes of war and destruction lie was once apt, aptly put by French socialist Jean Jaurès. He said, capitalism carries war within itself like a cloud carries the rain. In other words, war and capitalism are two sides of the same coin. As the capitalist economic system is built on the principle of competition and maximization of profits, exploitation and expansion are inherent for capitalism. The use of military means to maximize profits is for that reason a consequence of capitalism logic. So what can we do to counteract these imperialist tendencies and neocolonialist economy, which is trying economically or militarily to bring vast parts of the global south under its control? Part of the answer can be found in Franz Fanon's The Wretch of the Earth. In it, he notes that, quote, the European people must realize that in the past, they have often joined the ranks of our common masters where colonial questions were concerned, end of the quote. In other words, we need an alliance, an alliance between the people of the West and the people of the South. The common interest of such an internationalist alliance is evident not only on the issue of war and peace. The common goal must also be to overcome this role model of production as a source of national and imperialist exploitation. In that pursuit, the Western working class, as Fanon urged, must not allow themselves to be bought off with socio-imperialist socio -imperialist concessions from the ruling class and halt their fight against exploitation and for better standards of living at the national border. The task is rather to express international solidarity with all those forces in the South which stand up against neocolonialist oppression. In Germany, we have given ourselves the task of bringing about a change of mindset in German foreign policy, which is still being shaped by imperialist motives and colonialist mentalities. Critical reflection and systematic decolonization of our culture of public remembrance, which would include the genuine recognition of the Herrera or Nama genocide and the payment of appropriate Reparations are just the start. To create the essential context for the development of alternatives to take us beyond this neocolonialism, a multipolar world needs to emerge. The economic rise of China and the further development of international alliances like BRICS or of continent, con, uh, continental confederations like the African Union and the 
South American organization UNASUR, originally founded to act as a counterweight to the US dominated organization of American states, have the potential to shift the balance of power in that direction. Building on such a development, we might manage to tackle important issues pertaining to the world order, like renegotiating global trade relations, democratizing the United Nations, and demilitarization of the planet. As utopian as that scenario might sound, in the face of war, neo-colonial exploitation, and environmental destruction, there really is no alternative other than a more peaceful and fairer world order. I thank you a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward for the continuing the conversation. Thank you.